Welcome, church. I'm so glad to be back home and how timely for us to begin a series entitled Enough, that Jesus is enough. And so if you're wondering where we're going and what this series is about, it's a walk through the four chapters of the book of Colossians in the New Testament. So here's what I want you to do. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and join me in the New Testament this morning in the book of Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have a, a Bible, grab your device and find it there. If you don't have one of those, there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. And here's what I want you to do. we got some homework, okay? Everybody up for that? Okay, we got a couple people over here. I'll speak to this side of the room for a second then. So what I need you to do this week is read these four chapters in this amazing book by the Apostle uh, Paul in the New Testament this week. And it's going to take you less than 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. And you know what I want you to do when you're done reading it? Read again. Okay? And then when you're done reading it a second time, keep reading it. Keep reading it for the next handful of weeks because this is where we're going to be. We're really going to sit and soak and we're going to wring out everything that this book has to say for us in our life and times in regard to Jesus and him being enough. But I cannot tell you how glad I am to be home. I was down in the desert last week. But let me tell you this, the church is alive and thriving even in the desert. And I'm glad to be back to the cool temperatures of Fresno, California. I thought I'd never say that, ever, ever in any context, because it was a balmy 117 last week. Yeah, my dome piece was like frying. It was, it was, it was kind of scary. It was, it was kind of scary. But we're going uh, to jump into that. A couple things I just want to bring everybody up to date about. Now, this, is, this gives you reason to celebrate. We all get to celebrate because I was asking you for months, if not now, over a year and a half to be praying about this. And so uh, you're the first before 11 o'clock to hear that we have officially hired our new children's pastor. And what's so great is you're going to be able to meet Pastor Tony next Sunday. He and his wife Heather and their family will be here for their first Sunday. We're going to have a little reception down on ground floor for them. If you don't know where that is, there'll be arrows and stuff pointing in that direction next week. You don't need to worry about it right now. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it right now. Next week, you need to worry about it. You need to go over there and hug on his neck and accost him in Jesus' name and be like, oh, we're so glad you're here, and be really kind, okay? If you're not a kind person, don't go over there, please. Just get in your car and leave. Um, so we're excited. We're excited that he's going to be here joining our team, and I just know that God's got great things in store for our children's ministry through him. Next thing, I need your continued prayer, all right? So how many parents do we have in the room? How many grandparents do we have in the room? How many of us were babies at one point? <laughs> okay, you get where I'm going with this. So our junior high pastor, Kevin McNeil, and his wife, Erica, had their baby girl this past week, Michaela. Yeah, woo! <laughs> Michaela is currently at Valley Children's in their NICU, okay? They're just stabilizing some of her numbers and figures and things, and they're looking at uh, her heart, nothing imminent, but they need our prayer. And you know why? Because prayer matters. And you know why? Because I've got a niece who's at my house right now that was born at 31 weeks and two days at two pounds. Her daddy's ring could go over her little foot into her ankle. She was in the NICU for five weeks. They had to resuscitate her twice, but she is nine years old today, and she is smart, and she is brilliant, and she is beautiful, and Michaela is going to be fine because we are going to pray it in Jesus' name. Will you do that with me? I'm looking for a little... Okay, no, no, y'all are fine, y'all f- I need to talk to y'all up here for a second. <laughs> y'all need to get with it, all right? So please be praying for her. So if you've made your way over to the book of Colossians, we're going to be in chapter one. So take a trip with me for a second. Take a trip with me for just a minute as we get ready to delve into this book. And so you finally saved up that money, you want to go on that European vacation, right? 
Uh, people don't start like elbowing your significant others. This is fictitious. So anyway, so we're on this little trip together, and you're gonna, you finally made it to the Louvre, the famous Louvre Museum. And oh yes, and you're in Paris. You can smell it, the croissants, the coffee. <laughs> and so you're in the Louvre, and you're waiting in line because you want to see Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. You're waiting to see Mona Lisa. There she is. Is she happy? Is she sad? Is she irritated? Probably all the above. Who knows? We don't even know who she is. But there she is. It's one of the most famous and recognized paintings in all of human history. And as you're waiting there, because you can't take a picture, because it's going to do something to the painting, and I don't even know. And you realize the painting isn't huge. The painting is actually relatively small. And so there's all these people, and you're sitting there looking at it, and, and, you're, and you're waiting to get up close to it. And out of the corner of your eye, you, you see this individual walking up with a Crayola watercolor set and the paintbrush out, and nobody's stopping them, and they're moving straight to the painting. And they're dabbing their, their little paintbrush into some water and into the colors, and you see that they're moving right towards the painting of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. You're going to be absolutely freaked out at the thought of somebody who has the audacity that they can add to or do something beyond the beauty and the perfection of that painting. It'd be unthinkable. Or, or think about this. Now, now, now go over to the academia in, in Florence, Italy with me. Okay? You know what Tao's there? One of the most recognized sculptures that we've all seen. Michelangelo's David. For your viewing pleasure from the waist up. <laughs> there he is. From the, from the waist up. I didn't need those comment cards. And there you are, you're, you're beholding one of the most amazing sculptures ever. And all of a sudden, you, you hear this electric whir coming in. It's getting closer and closer and closer. And you see this lady walking up to David with a belt sander. You're like, what are you? No, 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 stop. I mean, it, it's just inconceivable to think that anybody's going to like, well, I, I just want to put a little bit more definition in his abs. Like, whatever the case might be. <laughs> It's just not something that would be done, even if you don't like art. Even if you're like, look, I don't want to go on that trip to Paris or to Italy with you. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. We have an appreciation for these pieces of art because they're perfect just the way they are. There's nothing anybody could do with some Crayola watercolors to improve upon the Mona Lisa. There's nothing any of us could do with a belt sander that would improve upon Michelangelo's David. Because as they are, they are enough. They're perfect. Don't add to it. Don't subtract from it. It's perfect just the way it is. And that's the reason the Apostle Paul wrote this letter that we're looking at for the next few weeks to the Colossians. See, we've got to understand a little bit of this city of Colossae before we delve into the implications of what he actually wrote to them. Because why would he write to them? We've got to understand. Why would the Holy Spirit in, inspire the Apostle Paul to pick up quill and parchment and, and have this dictated letter sent to them? Well, as, as we look historically at this little town, it, it really has no significance. It wasn't some big trade route. It, it didn't have some incredible natural resource that was unique to it. It wasn't some sort of agricultural giant. Better yet, it was kind of just known as the little town about 11 miles away from Laodicea, where John writes about in the book of Revelation. And so why in the world, because there's no real significance, would Paul write to these people in this town. And not only just write to them, but in the first chapter that we're going to take a look at, include in this book, in the New Testament, one of the greatest and grandest Christological passages in the entire New Testament. You say, hold on a second, Christological what? One of the greatest workings of Christ theology, the theology of who and the person and the work of Jesus is. One of the most beautiful, magnificent hymns in the entire New Testament exists in the first chapter of this book to a relatively insignificant group of people. And why is that? 
because there was growing thought amongst that town, amongst its people, that Jesus wasn't enough. There were people adding tradition, personal preference. They were adding to or subtracting from aspects of the commission and the commandment of Jesus. They were saying that Jesus could not stand on his own. That there were things that they wanted to add. And so if there was any reason for Paul to take up the defense and to write, it was to defend the very fact of which we stand on and we believe in this place that Jesus And all that he said, and all that he did, and all that he is, is enough. And so with that as a backdrop, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul pens this beautiful letter. And in it then begins to paint for us this magnificent picture of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But before we jump into it, word of prayer. Lord, we desperately, desperately need a high and exalted view and understanding of who you are, Jesus, in your magnificence, in your sovereignty, in your superiority, in your power, in your personhood. Lord, if we're familiar with this book, I pray that you would give us new eyes to see. If we've never read this letter before, I I pray that you would... Give us porous hearts and minds that we would be overwhelmed at who Jesus is. And it's in that powerful and wonderful name we pray. Amen. So going back to this little town of Colossae, like what made it so significant? So we got to understand, in the third century B.C., the Greek emperor Antiochus III colonized it with 2,000 Jewish families along with the Grecian families that already lived there. And so it made it a hotbed and ripe for something that developed in the first century along with the teachings of Jesus. And what was being developed because of the Jewish influence, because of the Greek influence, was something called syncretism. See, there was this syncretic view and approach towards Jesus, which means this. They were bringing in their cultural preferences, their their back theology of their pagan practices, or maybe even Jewish tradition into what it must look like and must be in order to follow Jesus. They were adding to Jesus. They were really kind of perpetuating a Jesus plus theology. You go, that's crazy. Who would do that? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. We do it in the church, and it's when we become legalistic. It's when we believe that a pattern of behaviors or a specific kind of belief or a personal conviction must be added to Jesus, that it must be Jesus plus this style of worship, Jesus plus this kind of approach, Jesus plus this kind of Bible study, Jesus plus any other thing that we add that we entitle and or think is as important as Jesus himself. And the thing is, as we build up these personal preferences and or opinions, they become hurdles preventing other people from even able to get to Jesus because we think that they've got to jump over our hurdles and through our hoops in order to do it our way before they can get to Jesus. So before we look at the church of the Colossians, we've really really got to look at ourselves and, and, and wonder, like, what are we doing? What have I done in my life where I've added Jesus plus? And so I'm just going to let you know, like, this is a great time of introspection for all of us. That we're all going to be taking into account, what have I added to Jesus? What are the additives that I've put there? Because syncretism in itself is destructive to Jesus. And so Paul, seeing this, seeing that somebody wants to bring their Crayola watercolors and a belt sander to Jesus, is compelled to write a letter to 
the Colossians, to let them know the supremacy and the superiority of Jesus. And what's amazing, now you've got to get into Paul's mind and his heart as he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit at this point. He opens up this letter with only 14 verses. He basically says, like, hey, how you guys doing? Love you. Been praying for you. And then he begins to crescendo. And you can feel him building because in verses 15 through 23, he hits a Christological hymn. It's as though he's singing it. It's as though it just kind of comes out of him. In my mind, I see his scribe barely able to keep up with Paul saying, like, say it again, say it again, because it just absolutely erupts out of him. He doesn't contest all the things that Jesus isn't. He begins by declaring who Jesus is, what he's done, his personhood, his power, his beauty. And like a great work of art, we get to stand back, and what he's doing is he's painting a picture, he's sculpting a work of art, and the picture that he displays for us is none other than the beauty of Jesus. And that's where we find Paul beginning in verse 15 of chapter 1. Paul goes on to write, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. I, I, I particularly like the fact that he writes that invisible. There's things he created you can't even see. You don't even know about it, but he did that too. I'm all alone here. <laughs> Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things. Reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, you, not somebody else, now it's getting personal. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith. Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see the picture that he has painted, the sculpture that he's crafted? And when you go to a museum and, and, and you look at a beautiful work of art, you're supposed to, you're supposed to gaze at it. You're supposed to drink it in. And the idea is the longer that you look at it, the more you appreciate it. There's intricacies of it and details that at a first glance you might miss. And what Paul wants us to do is step into the museum of the divine and gaze upon Jesus. And as we do, the intricacies and the beauty of who he is and what he's done and, and, and what he continues to do in our lives come to clear focus for us, beginning with the very fact that Jesus is the image in the firstborn. The image in the firstborn. See, Jesus is the God man, not just a good man. Oh, we got to start there first. Jesus isn't one of many. He's the one and only and Paul ratifies this point by using a very specific word. He says he is the image. That Greek word there is icon. Basically, here's where he is giving us the idea that when we look at Jesus, we are seeing a portrait of God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. You want to know how God acts towards those who don't know him, look at Jesus. You want to know what God has to say about the religious elitist, look at Jesus. But better yet, from one of my favorite commentators, he says something not only about seeing a, a portrait of God when we look at Jesus, and I'll just, I'll recite his own words. Listen to what he says. He goes, look at Jesus. 
He shows you not only what God is, here it is. He also shows you what you were meant to be. In Jesus Christ is the revelation of the Godhead and the revelation of true humanity. This is, this is, this is it right here. So when we look at Jesus, we realize what God is forming us into, what he is refining us towards. He, he shows us how we are to love each other. He shows us how we are to step into the messiness of other people's lives. He, he shows us the way that we are to be compassionate and loving. He shows us the way that we're supposed to be sacrificial. He shows us that we've got to look at ourselves before we start pointing the finger at other people. That he's doing a great work in us. That he's still refining us. That he's doing a beautiful work of restoration in us. You know, paintings, they get marred over a long period of time. Bring in a professional person who can restore it back to its beauty. That's what Jesus in new life in him is doing in us. He's restoring in us the beauty of our original intent, created after God himself in his very own image, that we would more than ever be able to reflect the beauty of who Jesus is. Because as we see him, we see the standard of ourselves. We look at Jesus, we see a beautiful picture of God. Now, there was one thing in here that I just realized that I need to cover for clarification purposes, and it's the use of the word firstborn. We look at firstborn, and we immediately think of something that has been created. I've got three sons. One of them is my firstborn. That means he was first amongst the others that followed. There will be no others after him, but there are three, and three is good. Hallelujah. Three is the Trinity, and we felt that that was good. If it's good for God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's good for Drew, Tyler, and Bryce. And so we have a son, and he is our firstborn. And so we say firstborn, our understanding is sequence and order. Sequence and order of creation. Well, we got to understand this. As we look to interpret the Bible first, the Bible interprets itself. That's our hermeneutic. That's our principle of biblical interpretation. That's what that means, is the Bible interprets itself. And so we don't speculate in our own current context what that means. We look at its usage throughout the canon, 66 books of the Bible, how the usage of firstborn is used. And it's used primarily in regard to most favored and places of special honor. So let me give you a couple examples. You can go back for study, but I needed to address this so anybody didn't leave going like, so Jesus was created? I don't get this. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. The use of firstborn is in relation to the place of Israel in the Old Testament. You move forward a little bit into Psalm 89, 27. Firstborn is a place of special honor in regard to a kingship that is incomparable to anyone else. And so what we understand in the use of firstborn in relation to Jesus, here it is. Jesus was not created, but rather most favored, holding a place of special honor in comparison to everything and everyone else. Therefore, he cannot be added to Jesus is enough. But don't take my word for it in the usage of it. The passage goes on to tell us he wasn't the created one. He is the creator himself. Listen, verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is creator. And it's not localized to this one letter by the Apostle Paul. See, the disciple John also, as he opens up his letter, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the understanding there, in the Greek understanding, is the Word is the supreme logos. Nothing is greater. It's always existed. And as he talks about the supreme logos, the Word, he's making that in reference to Jesus himself. Going on to say in chapter 1, verse 3, all things 
were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In summary, Jesus created it all. He is the agent of creation. And here's what's amazing. We talk about being creatives, and we talk about creating things. We can only re-envision what is. We can't create how Jesus did. Because you know what Jesus used in order to create what is? Nothing but the power and the authority of his voice. As he spoke it into creation, therefore it was. He has the power to speak creation. Oh, what does that mean for us? I'm glad you asked. If he can speak creation into existence, Jesus can speak renewal into our lives. Jesus can speak hope into our lives, restoration into our lives, transformation for our lives, healing for our lives. If he can make what is out of nothing, what can't he do in our life? Am I the only one excited about that? Do you realize that? That we're talking about this amazing, magnificent image of Jesus, and if he can speak all of creation into our into existence. What is it that he can't speak and do in our lives? He he can speak right now. Do you want to see the relevance of this? Right now, there are friends and family of people who have lost loved ones that we don't know and we might not have any contact with, but the God of the universe is able to speak peace into their loss right now. That's why it matters. He's able to speak hope into the midst of their loss. He's able to speak kindness into the midst of their bewilderment. He's able to speak mercy in the midst of our grief. And if he can create things by the power of his word, he can also heal things by the power of his word. Word. It goes on to say, because we got a lot of ground to cover in this, verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What does that mean for us? As we look at this beautiful picture of Jesus, Jesus is sustainer. He literally is the glue that holds creation together. He created it and sustains it from the deepest recesses of space down to a molecular, microscopic level. Jesus holds it all together. Why does that matter for us? Ooh, because sometimes we feel like we've fallen apart, don't we? Can we? Uh, come on. There's some, truthful, there's some truthful people here. They're right here. So I'm looking at y'all as they're like telling the truth. We can feel as though life's falling apart, right? And we say things like, I just can't hold it all together. Huh? I can't, hold my, I can't hold my marriage together. It's just, oh, it's just fractured. I can't hold my family together. My kids are crazy. You're probably a little bit crazy too. And we can't hold it all together. If Jesus is the one who creates and the one who sustains, can he not sustain what feels like it's fracturing in your life? If we go to him in a state of dependence, because what we do is we gravitate towards independence. We want to do it ourselves. We want to take matters into our own hands. And when we do that, we more times than not make a mess of stuff, don't we? Jesus goes, come to me. I I am sustainer. I am the one who holds everything together. I'm glad we've got that settled. We're moving on. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the head. Who is the senior pastor of this church? Somebody said me. No, not me. Thank you. I'm flattered. But no, not me. Wrong. You're like, darn it. I shouldn't have said it out in class. Jesus. Jesus is the head of the bridge. Jesus is the head of every church. At least he should be. Who's it all about? Okay, we're going to do a little call and response. And so it's going to be real easy. I'm going to ask a question. Your response is Jesus to them all. (laughs) Who is our hope? Who fills us with grace? Who is the one that this is all about prepositionally in, to, by, for, with, and in? It's all about Jesus. All of it. And the second, it's not, we've gone off the rails. So if you're new here, you're like, okay, I think I'm catching on. (laughs) 
It's all about Jesus. Who is this book about? Absolutely. Luke 24, 27, Jesus goes, hey, by the way, let me go ahead and tell you how this all talks about me, beginning with the law and the prophets. It's all about me. It's for me. And here's what's great. In us understanding that, Jesus gives us a model for ministry. You want to hear it? This is amazing. This is liberating for us as followers of Jesus. Here it is. Resist the religious and be merciful, understanding, and gracious toward everyone else. That was the ministry of Jesus. There it is. Who did Jesus get so frustrated with? Pharisees. Religious folks. Religious folks who are, who are a little self-righteous and that they feel like they've cornered the market on what it looks like to be good. And Jesus is like, stop. Stop. Just quit because you're so wrong. And what you're doing is you're building up hurdles between the truth and other people. And who did he sit down with? And who was he merciful with? And who was he so kind with? He was kind and merciful and loving towards the marginalized. The people who had been told, you got to get it right and you got to act a certain way and you got to know a certain thing before you can ever be a part of this. You know what? That will never be this church. These doors will always be wide open. You bring your mess because we want you to meet the maker first. He's the one who changes things. He's the one who transforms us, not behaviors. Many times we get it backwards thinking, if you will change what you do, it will change your heart. That doesn't work, said every parent in the room. Amen? I mean, we just realized we're like, that's not. And that's where we realize we need Jesus to change the heart. Then the actions follow. Man, as we gaze at the artwork that is the superiority and the supremacy of Jesus, man, we're just overwhelmed by him. It's not a matter of then we have to follow is we get to follow. It's not a matter of I have to obey, I get to obey. It's not a matter of I have to please, I get to please because I see how majestic and beautiful and amazing you are. But I got to keep going. Verse 20, I knew this was going to be like drinking from a fire hose today, but you know what? I want us to be overwhelmed that Jesus is enough. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Here's one of the things that's most amazing. Jesus is reconciler and peacemaker. Oh my goodness. Now when we stop and we think in church about reconciliation, we typically think vertically. That Jesus is the one who made the way that we would be right with God. And that's true. That's fundamentally crucial to what it looks like to have relationship with Jesus. That, that, that we could not be right with the Father if it wasn't because of the Son. But reconciliation is also horizontal. Man, there's a lot of animosity in our world, right? Right? Like, have you read the news? You see what's going on. There's a lot of hate and a lot of angst and a lot of racism, a lot of bigotry. There's a lot of desire for things to be made right. And the only one who can reconcile that is Jesus. And you go, well, how's Jesus going to do that? In you. In us. We're the ones who step in the gap and, and hold the hands and go, there is a lot more that makes us similar than it ever does make us different. We've all been created in the image of God and we get to be co-reconcilers with Jesus of a world that is so fractured and separated. And that he's peacemaker, man. <laughs> Who doesn't that resonate with? We want peace of mind. We want peace in our life. We want peace in our nation. We want peace on a global level, but yet, Many times we're looking for an institution or a policy or a party to do it when it's a person. His name is Jesus. That is what he does is that Jesus is enough. Reconciler and peacemaker. If you're sitting here today right now and maybe you're the wife who, who drug your husband in 
And you were like, this is it. Like, if we don't, if something doesn't happen today, we are done. Don't you think he can make peace in your marriage? I'm saying throw, throw yourself at his mercy. Parent who's in here right now and, and you're just thinking, I have done too much, said too much, and I've ostracized that child and they're too far gone and they'll never forgive me for the things I've said and did. Don't you think that if he can make peace eternally with us, there's not hope that he can make peace relationally with you and that child? And we see Jesus on this grandiose scale. Many times it can feel so impersonal, possibly, that, that Jesus is doing all this stuff for all these other people. But I want your eyes to go down to verse 22 of chapter 1. This is where it gets personal. Listen to this. It says, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death to present you. Point to yourself for a second. Everybody do it. Everybody's got to participate or I'll call you out and it's going to be really weird. <laughs> to present you, present you holy and blameless and above reproach to him. He's done that through the work of the cross. You. And what's beautiful is, is we're going to observe communion. We're going to have like a little fireside chat here for a second, okay? Everybody cool? What we have here is, is, is communion, and it's the visible representation that we have of the new contract that Jesus cut for us in the New Testament. The new contract. He says, look, it used to be through a people, now it's for all people. And it's going to be ratified my sacrifice my body's going to be broken and my blood's going to be spilled that you might know that I am sustainer that I am creator that I am peacemaker that I am reconciler at the end of the day that you would know that I am enough so we're going to come up as a church today and we're going to observe communion and it's a time of reflection first and foremost the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us, look, like, don't do this flippantly. Understand what Jesus has done on our behalf. Understand the significance of what this represents. Your good intentions aren't enough. Your good works aren't enough. Your failures aren't too big. Your hopes and dreams won't be good enough. But Jesus is enough. And if you follow Jesus, I want you to be reminded of how magnificent he is today as you take into account where you are, what he's done, what he continues to do in you. And I want you to come down here just a bit and declare he is enough by taking a piece of this bread and dipping it into this juice. <laughs> and I want to invite you, maybe you don't know Jesus and you're like, so do I get to do this? If you realize today that Jesus is enough for you, I want to invite you and tell you this table's open for you. <laughs> Jesus says, come, come, come to me. I don't want to make this unnecessarily convoluted for you. It's very easy. Jesus says, Reco recognize that you're not perfect. Eh, that's kind of easy to do. And that I live the perfect life for you to take your imperfect life from you. Okay? And there's a whole bunch of stuff after that, and that's all commentary. Right now, you need to understand the person and the work of Jesus made available for you. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for you if you want to pray that for the first time and realize you want to start a journey with Jesus. And then I want to invite you to come to the table. We've got a gluten free option here. The band's going to play. This is a time of reflection and declaration that Jesus is enough. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are enough, that our good works can't do it, that our good intentions can't cut it, that Jesus, you aren't just a good man, you're the God man. You are the very portrait and image of God himself, the beauty of divinity on display for us to behold and respond to that you are creator, that you are sustainer, that you are life giver, that you are the head of the church, that you are reconciler and you are peacemaker.
Lord, would that just so saturate our very being today that we would just be overwhelmed. We would be your hands and feet at work, at school, at play, at home, and everywhere in between. Lord, thank you for inspiring Paul to write these beautiful words, to explode into a declarative hymn that you are enough. In Jesus' name.